Number 10, the Mars family. I want candy, you want candy, we all want candy. The Mars family owns Mars Inc, which is, and you guessed it, the Mars Bar Company. They are one of the world's largest candy and pet food companies, right? Like what, like, how do those go together? You know, kinda weird. The family themselves come from humble beginnings. Frank Mars started Mars Inc way back in 1911 when he started selling candy from his kitchen in Tacoma, Washington. The malt flavored nougat we all know and love wasn't actually made until 1929 when they came up with the Milky Way. How exactly they made the transition from candy to pet food is like beyond me, but that aspect of the biz expanded in 2017. They acquired the animal hospital company VCA, making a $9 billion investment. Overall, the company is worth, get ready, $40 billion in sales. What? So they're rich and they own candy. Well, okay, they're really rich and they own candy. For one, they can influence anyone. And consider the fact that sugar is considered an addictive substance. And then also, Willy Wonka, right? Fiction or non-fiction, candy is a big deal. Imagine a world without it. Number nine, the Morgans. The Morgans sound like the family that lives next door who outdo everyone when it comes to like holiday decorations. But I'm talking about the JP Morgans who could probably do that and control the world at the same time. The Morgan family is one of the most influential American families. Their dynasty is tied to banking and you have probably heard the name JP Morgan over like a hundred times in passing. At the turn of the century, Morgan was the most influential businessman in America. He was so admired and respected that on the day of his funeral, the stock exchange remained closed until 12 p.m. To give you an idea about how much financial success he attained, he bailed out the US Treasury twice. His ability to do this no doubt caused great uneasiness among other people and resulted in the development of the reserve system in late 1913. Today, the Morgans still maintain their political and financial influence, not just in the US, but also in Europe, as their company is there as well. So, world connections. Number 8, Pritzer. Arriving from Ukraine late in the 19th century, the Pritzer family made everyone believe that the American dream could be reality. 50 years into their journey as entrepreneurs, they finally started to invest in real estate. That one decision led to over 900 hotels the family owns today, plus an airline and a cruise line just for like extra pizzazz. Ever heard of the Hyatts? That's them. Like many on this list, they are not without shares in different financial institutions, amplifying their influence. After all, if you got your hands on someone else's money, well, you can pretty much do what you want. J.B. Pritzer was the governor of Illinois in 2019, so there's the political influence, and his sister Penny worked as the Secretary of Commerce in the Obama administration. Administration. So not only are they the ninth on the Forbes list of richest families, their political influence is even more obvious. Their net worth is over $32.5 billion, which they use to back the presidential campaigns of Obama and Hillary Clinton. An astounding, astounding amount of wealth, which of course has been met with competition and strife. Liesl Pritzer Simmons, once a child actress known for Little Princess, didn't know this, now a prominent impact investor, actually sued her own father along with her entire family in 2000. Her father and cousins looted her and her brother's trust funds, so she filed a $6 billion lawsuit, settling with $500 million plus $280 million in cash plus more control over her trust valued at $170 million. So not quite the $6 billion she wanted, but still, <laughs> no complaints, I would hope. No complaints. Number seven, the House of Windsor. Whether you consider them the figureheads of the monarchy, the House of Windsor remains one of the most powerful families in the world. They are the reigning family monarchy in Great Britain, and although they may not be the richest on this list, their wealth does not simply lie in money. The Windsors reigned over the entire British Empire, which of course included the fruits of the colonial pursuits of jolly old England from years past. Their colonies, protectorates, and dominions spread across the world. They were also recognized as the official monarchy of several independent countries. Therefore, their wealth is in many pies, as it were. Along with the fanfare that follows, people are obsessed with them. Like the whole Meghan Markle thing. It's nuts. Queen Elizabeth II is the head of the family, the church, and the commander in chief of Great Britain's military troops. Along with performing her duties as supreme ruler of 15 autonomous countries. Fun fact, um, this is a fun fact. My grandparents met her twice at the Queen's Garden Party and they said hi and she's very queenly and that was all I really found out about that. But that was cool. Number six, Rockefeller. John Davidson Rockefeller may have picked up a few tricks from his dad when he started his American empire. Son of a con man, Rockefeller bought out several owners of Cleveland's largest oil refinery in 1865. Then he just, he just kept going. Buying out competitors left, right, and center, which led him to take over 90% of America's refineries and pipelines. But beneath 
Underneath all that success were dubious dealings with corporate spies, secret railroad deals, bribery, leading the US attorney to sue Standard Oil after this came to light. However, the trial only resulted in the company breaking off into 34 sub companies and allowed Rockefeller to maintain ownership. By the time John D. died, his assets equaled out to 1.5% of America's total economic output. That's more than anybody has ever made today. Today, the 200 descendants of the Rockefeller family have a net worth of over 11 billion, which is significantly less than what they had before. Though their considerable wealth is not what it once was, their name still carries immense weight to this day. John's grandson, David Rockefeller, is the man who stirred up rumors of conspiracy in the 1950s due to his highly secretive meetings. His enigmatic behavior added to fuel to the fire towards the suspicion that the Rockefeller family seeks to gain or maintain control of the world. Number five, the House of Sod. I feel like if you even have your baby toe dipped in oil somewhere in the world, in a metaphorical sense of course, you can control the world. It's just, it's it's the most important thing, we use it all the time. The House of Zod is the royal family of Saudi Arabia. They, like many powerful families on this list, have old money. Especially since they are descendants of the founder of the first Saudi state. The king of Saudi Arabia reigns with absolute power, meaning he could make anything he want happen at the snap of his fingers. They could start a war if they wanted to, and that they have. They consider the country to be an asset, especially since they reign on precious crude oil reserves about 20% of the world's global resources. The entire House of Saud has 15,000 members, so to be clear, we are specifically talking about the 2,000 members of the inner circle. The actual family under the king of Saudi Arabia can get any job they want, so long as it's in the country. Number 4. The Bush Family Yep, we mean that one. Of course, you would expect the families on this list to have political connections. Otherwise, how else would you rule the world? Their family has made it into the political offices for over 70 years, with good old G.W. Bush being the 43rd president. But of course, we must discuss a pretty seedy scandal. Documents finally declassified in 2003 revealed that Prescott Sheldon Bush had dealings with the German army during World War II. The Guardian reported in 2004 that Prescott worked for and profited from companies closely involved with the German businesses that financed the man who rhymes with Mittler's rise to power. Meaning he could have been prosecuted for providing air and comfort to the enemy that killed millions of innocents. Additionally, ad this is crazy. Additionally, he continued his support after it was revealed what the Yahtzees were doing. And you know what I mean by Yahtzees, I just can't say it because YouTube, censorship. Ugh, I hate it. But anyways, the documents even imply that the US knew where the camps were and could have disabled them long before they were finally discovered. Number three, Rothschild. The conspiracy surrounding this family appear to me never ending and some of them may be right. After all, the possibilities are endless when you carry that much influence in your wallet. The Rothschilds are one of the most wealthy families in the world and their legacy goes all the way back to the 17th century. That is the oldest money I think we have on this list. Mayor Amschel Rothschild established a banking business back then and became the personal banker for the German royal families. His five sons then took the business and expanded it into London, Paris, Frankfurt, Vienna and Naples. British and French war efforts have relied on their funding, including the Napoleonic Wars in 1803 to 1815. This family literally had a hand in the success of war. If that's not power, then I don't know what is. Though their business remains in control of banking, they also have hands in real estate, oil, and construction. So basically, everything around us. Number two, the Murdochs. No, I'm not talking about the Canadian classic everybody watches on a Sunday that's been running forever, Murdoch Mysteries. How are ya? But same name. To say the media plays a huge role in every part of our lives is an understatement even to say that. It's at the rate we consume media, on our phones, on the subway, on the street, TV, computer, on headphones, you'd have to head to the Alaskan Triangle just to get away from it. Which is why the Murdochs are so damn powerful. The Murdochs control several broadcasting networks, their reach stretching across three continents. So needless to say, their influence has very little borders. Their imperialism began in Australia by a political reporter for the Melbourne papers, Keith Murdoch. Keith climbed his way up to editor and after he figured out how to double the sales, he became CEO. His son Robert followed in his footsteps as a reporter and together they formed the News Corporation which held the power of Australia's media in the palm of their hands. But the corporation now owns 20th Century Fox, Fox News, MySpace and Dow Jones plus I think a few more. However, there is no fame without scandal and 2011 the News Corp was prosecuted for illegal legal phone tapping of celebrities, the royal family, and even bribed police and special units. People thought that maybe, I don't know, like maybe this should topple the entire empire, but it didn't. It remains standing and who knows what's happening behind the scenes. And 
last but not least, number one, the Waltons. And hitting in at number one on the Forbes list of America's richest families, we have the Waltons. Their net worth being $247 billion. Fun fact, if you were to start counting to a billion today, it would take you 30 years to complete. So imagine counting to $247 billion. Somebody do the math for me down below in the comments. Guess what they own? Walmart, which is the world's largest retailer by sales. However, they also own Arvis Bank, banks, right? Which operates 16 banks in Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Kansas. An unfathomable amount of wealth that this family hoards, and it looks like they want to keep it that way. The Waltons have played a lead role in eliminating the federal estate tax, which would essentially help billionaires evade estate tax entirely, right? Their influence also carries over easily into politics, considering the average election campaign costs $10 million. The Waltons could easily make that in under a day on their business earnings alone. According to Bloomberg, they can make around $100 million a day. Who do you think gets to dictate the terms when your candidate needs money? On top of that though, they also donate a lot of money towards education and environmental initiatives, and of course, have their grand share of vintage cars, art, and properties. Apparently it still sucks to work at Walmart though. So, starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the entrepreneur. Okay. This neighbor story starts out actually quite nice before it takes one of the wildest turns I've ever seen. So, basically the storyteller starts out by explaining that their old neighbor was like the perfect neighbor. They were quiet, they were polite and cordial, and sometimes the two of them would even share a quick chat should they run into each other in the hall. Truly the dream neighbor. The story starts to take a different turn when the storyteller reveals that their nice neighbor is certainly in the business of selling illicit substances, we'll call them. But they also explain that all of his customers were also lovely and were sure to not make too much noise when they were coming by, even if it was late at night or early in the morning. Now, here's where the story takes quite the turn. <laughs> Turns out that one night, some sort of altercation ensued and this nice quiet neighbor ended up taking the lives of two people who were at his door. Apparently it all happened in the hallway which was quite a gruesome scene afterwards. The storyteller has quite the twist again at the end when they write quote, it was crazy. Still, after he got sent to prison a new guy moved in that played music constantly as loud as he possibly could. I'll take old Stevie back any day. Honestly I don't agree but I completely understand. In our number 9 spot today we have the plot twist. As if that one wasn't enough. Okay, this story is a short one, but man is it effective. They start out by saying, quote, I used to live in a house that was split into two apartments. My neighbor had the lower half and I learned we had issues with the HVAC when their cigarette smoke came visibly pouring out our registers, stank up everything we owned. Okay, that definitely sucks. I'm sure it's a situation many people have dealt with before and it would be really frustrating and honestly, it's hazardous. Surprisingly though, this isn't the worst of it. There is one more sentence to the story and it somehow still manages to take us on quite a journey. So after they wrote, quote, stake up everything we owned, they finished with, quote, then one of them stole my car. <laughs> Okay, honestly worse than the smoke, and also I have a million questions about this. Starting with how, and ending with what happened after. I would love a follow up on this one. In our number 8 spot today we have a house's history. So there are places that have certain rules around what a selling agent would have to tell an interested buyer about the history of the house prior to purchasing. Some things are extremely important to some people and not at all to others. I mean for example, some people don't really mind living in houses that were once the scene of a horrific crime, I personally feel like I wouldn't exactly be comfortable with that. Some things in some areas however don't have such widespread rules when it comes to these things, which means that sometimes new homeowners are in for quite a surprise just like these ones. This story starts off, quote, when we moved in, he, meaning the neighbor, came over to tell us the house had previously burned down twice news to us. Okay, that's interesting, but not too scary yet. But they continue on to say, quote, got the feeling he wanted to sort of brag about how he saved people from the fires. Then a few years later, after leaving our garage door open, we found our stored grill with all the unlit burners on and a bit of burnt paper sitting underneath. He's since disappeared, but we lock up our propane now. What in the world? How terrifying. 
The man disappeared? This is why I Google everything first, from places to people. I scour the internet prior because you never know, people are strange. In our number seven spot today, we have the backdoor neighbor. This story starts off when a couple moved into a new house in the summer of 2019. Upon moving in, both of the neighbors on either side warned this couple about the neighbor who lived behind them as they had been known to cause quite a bit of trouble. The first six months were fine, but things quickly took a turn. They go on to explain that, quote, their house sits on a hill behind ours, and so it overlooks the majority of our backyard due to the elevation change. Well, one night, more Morning, technically. At about 3 a.m., we wake up to ring notifications from our phones showing video from our front doorbell. There's a man standing barefoot in a sleeveless shirt on our porch, pounding on our front door. We give it two to three minutes just watching him on the app, thinking maybe he's drunk and has the wrong house, essentially giving him the benefit of the doubt. At this point, the guy at the door starts to yell, he's cursing, he's saying that he's gonna fight them, and then he leaves the front to head around the side of the house towards the backyard. They still have no idea who this is, so they of course call the police. Police. Before the police arrive, the neighbor behind them turns on a huge spotlight that's shining into the storyteller's backyard, and they're thinking, okay, our neighbors, they know something's going on, and they gave us some light to like check it all out or whatever. Turns out, not the case at all. Once the police arrive, it becomes clear that the spotlight neighbor is the one who was pounding on the door, and here's the reason. The neighbor said to the police when they showed up that he was angry because a few nights prior, in the middle of the night, the storyteller let his dog out in his own backyard, but that when he did it, he was in his boxers, and the neighbor was claiming that he did it on purpose to make him uncomfortable since their yard looks down on the storytellers and they could see everything. They then write, quote, he he then followed this up to the police with evidence, which consisted of videos he had taken through our windows of my wife and I inside our own home doing totally normal things like chores, watching TV, etc. Nothing inappropriate or scandalous, not that it would have mattered anyway, we were in our own home. This story truly is next level. <laughs> In the end, the police clearly understood that there was a breach of privacy, and it is said that the weird neighbors moved out a few months after, and the couple celebrated that like it was a holiday. And I do not blame them one little bit. In our number six spot today, we have Sebald. Okay, so what happened to friendly neighbors coming over to ask to borrow a cup of sugar? Was that ever how things were, or is that just what movies in Hollywood fed us? It's gotta be made up, right? Or else, how did we get from that to this? This story reads, quote, a guy named Sibald. He straight up smelled like tuna all the time. He'd come knock on our door to ask for random things in his robe, a rubber band, an apple slicer, a doorstop, like probably once a week. My bedroom door faced his kitchen, and sometimes I'd look over and see him lying on the floor. It was bizarre. Sibald, what in the world is going on? Are you okay? Listen, this isn't the scariest or the worst neighbor. The man just needs some items and likes lying on the floor. I'm certainly not judging, I'm just wondering why. I would have a lot of questions for Sibald if he was my neighbor, but hey, at least he's not out here causing harm. That's definitely more than we can say for some other people on today's list. In our number five spot today, we have the early riser. Okay, if anyone has any idea as to what could be going on in this one, please let me know, because from where I'm standing, it just is all extremely weird. This weird neighbor story explains that this specific neighbor loved to get up early. Not like absurdly early, but a solid 6 a.m. wake up every day, which is for sure a commitment. That isn't weird, a lot of people do that, but what a lot of people don't do after their 6 a.m. wake up every day is proceed to go out into the backyard of their home and fight a random mannequin while shouting at the top of their lungs. I guess the whole neighborhood is waking up at 6 a.m. every morning now, too, because this guy's got some steam he needs to release. Honestly, this would be the most annoying thing, but I'd also be very curious and concerned as to what this was all about. In our number four spot today, we have Goat Guy. Okay, this is definitely not an inherently terrifying story, but it is so bizarre that it has me just a little on edge. So basically, this short little explanation is, quote, old guy that lived next door when I was young would shower in the backyard, would buy goats to do his lawn, eventually he stopped buying goats and would just set the lawn on fire. I mean, buying goats to eat your grass so you don't have to cut it is a very expensive method, but a method nonetheless. But setting it on fire? 
<laughs> what an absolute hazard to yourself and everyone around you. There's just so much bizarrity going on in this one, I don't even know what to think. In our number three spot today, we have Linda Listen. This neighbor story starts off with a storyteller explaining that they have quite a few interesting neighbor stories from this one in particular named Linda. They go on to write, quote, Linda would often have men outside the apartment building that she locked out screaming her name. But the best story regards a boyfriend Linda had who insisted my roommate and I call him the captain. About a week after meeting him, we came home to a wedding announcement for Linda and the captain. Yes, his name was the captain on the announcement. Exactly one week later still, the captain was arrested outside of our apartment building for public intoxication at 2am while screaming, I've made a huge mistake, F you Linda, a huge mistake, I'm ruined. It seems as though this guy was no longer the captain. I have no idea what happened here or what led to this demise, but I mean, I can't exactly say I'm surprised. In our number two spot today, we have Cat Lady. This story is from someone named Kate, and she starts off explaining that she had a cat named Donovan, and her strange neighbor was named Susan. Susan was single in her 50s, seemed nice, and had a lovely garden. Kate then goes on to write, quote, one summer we were going on vacation for a week. We asked if she could look after the cat while we were gone. She enthusiastically said yes, and offered to have our cat stay at her house so it wouldn't get bored or lonely. How sweet of her. Kate then explains that they go away on vacation, everything's great, but when they came back and Kate's mom went to pick up the cat, things went awry. She explains that Susan was weirdly attached to this cat after one week, so much so that she was full on weeping when she was giving the cat back. Kate's mom was weirded out, but thanked her, paid her, and then left. Kate then goes on to write that a few days later she woke up early and came to find out that Susan had walked the entire acre that separated their houses in order to try and look for Donovan. She was saying that she just needed to see her baby. Kate says that it was weird, but they let it go this time. But then she writes, quote, Then one day we had let our cat out for a while, it was an indoor-outdoor cat, and when we called him to come in, he didn't come. We checked all the places he usually lounged and he was nowhere to be found. We searched for hours. Finally, after a day of searching, my dad said, oh my god, Susan. Could she? My parents quickly went over there to ask if she had seen the cat, and Susan vehemently denied knowing anything about where the cat was. She was visibly angry about being asked, and then offered up, what do you think, that I stole him? Then my mom started calling his name and whistling for him, and before Susan could get the door slammed, he strolled to the door from somewhere inside the house and greeted my mom with a meow. My mom was pissed. She started yelling about, if you ever steal our cat again, and I ought to call the police and left. He was an indoor cat for the next few months until we moved again. Honestly, could you imagine your neighbor stealing your animal? I would have absolutely lost my mind. In our number one spot today, we have the Flyers. So this story starts out with a storyteller explaining to us that he lives in a fourplex that is mostly elderly people living in it, and that there was another fourplex across from them, and that was basically the situation for the entire block. So one night, when our storyteller is going out with some friends, as they are leaving his place, a neighbor of his comes out and um, um, a very hateful altercation ensues. The neighbor man yells some horrible things, the storyteller yells some things back, and that's when the neighbor makes some very serious threats, and then the storyteller just carries on with heading out for the night. Then he goes on to write, quote, Well, when I got home, he had super glued my screen door completely shut, poured hamburger helper or something similar into my AC unit, scratched up my very expensive and still quite new Lexus SUV. This isn't where it ends though. They then take photos from the storyteller's Facebook and use them to spread a horrible, dangerous rumor about the storyteller. The insane neighbor used these photos to make posters and flyers spreading this rumor, and then on the back of them, quote, he stated where I worked, what time I left, what time I arrived, when I took lunch, and where I went on the weekends. It was very unusual. I ended up having to take him to court, file a restraining order against him after he showed up to my job, threatened to burn down my building, which I finally had enough and went outside to fight him. Luckily, my employees already had him cornered out in the parking lot. Thank God for restraining orders. You guys, this one is probably the most insane we have on this list. That's just next level and also very dangerous. I'm just glad the storyteller made it through this entire ordeal and I hope that they were awarded with great neighbors from then on. Number 10, the Abani family. Someone mentioned this family in the comments last time, so here we are. Let's chat, shall we? 
With a net worth of $44.8 billion, they are listed as one of Asia's most rich families. Dhirubhai Abani is the man behind the legacy. As a teen, he demonstrated strong skills in retailing and selling oil. In order to support his family, he began exporting importing spices and fabric, which later became Reliance Commercial Corporation, the now billion dollar company. Like what? He had two sons named Mukesh and Anil who took over the company, but due to a falling out, the empire has since been divided. His son Mukesh Abani now owns the company, however, and it hasn't suffered for it. And in 2017, the company soared due to better refining margins. Reliance also sparked an oil and gas price war in India's hyper competitive telecom market. I believe I said something about having a hand in oil means you've got a hand on the world. That remains to be true. Number nine, the Bush family. The Bush family is an American dynasty, as you can probably already guess from the name. The family is best known for their involvement with politics. The Bushes have various national and state offices spanning across five generations. There was US Senator Prescott Bush, Jeb Bush, as well as of course George W. Bush. That's not what he sounds like, but anyways, you get my point. Other family members are involved in sports, hitting touchdowns in the NFL, politics, sports, America. So it's pretty clear that they have their hands deeply rooted in the soil of the USA. The one of, if not the most powerful country in the world. Through five Five wealthy and powerful generations, the wealth of the Bush family has expanded across investment bankers, magazine publishing, remember what I said about media in the last video, the Supreme Court, justice, the railroad, on top of everything else previously mentioned. Yeah, so is it a secret that they kind of rule the world? Not really, because when you've got your fingers in so many pies, you might as well just be the whole bake sale. Number eight, the Benton Courts. The estimated net worth of the Benton Courts is over 91.7 billion. Why? Well, L'Oreal. Eugene Schuler founded the revolutionary cosmetics company all the way back in 1907. If you have to ask why they secretly rule the world, and you do not know the importance of having a good hair day. It could change the whole thing. Hair is everything. Lillian Bentecourt was a surviving heiress and owner of the company before she died at the age of 94 in 2017. She was the richest woman in the world at the time. Francois Bentecourt Myers is the granddaughter of the founder who continues a rich legacy. She profits from the 33% stock in the company and now serves as the heiress to the fortune. In between revolutionizing the hair game, the family continues to support French progress in the sciences and the arts. They also donated $226 million to help repair the Notre Dame after the massive fire, if you recall. So, um, yeah, they have a lot of money. People love their hair. What a world. Number seven, the Buffets. When you think of the stock image of an incredibly rich man, Warren Buffett is probably not far off, but honestly, I hope this guy in part rules the world because he seems to actually be doing some good. Known as the Oracle of Omaha, Buffett is one of the most successful investors of all time. He currently runs Berkshire Hathaway, which owns over 60 companies, including Geico, Duracell, Dairy Queen, batteries, ice cream, insurance, what more could you want? His current net worth is 100.8 billion. Considering he bought his first stock at 11 and filed taxes at age 13, pretty good. Pretty good, Buffett. But despite his massive wealth, he actually isn't a big fan of dynastic living. He believes his money would be best given to the world rather than his kids. What? That's nuts. That's not to say his kids aren't already well off, but Buffett has promised to donate 99% of his wealth. So far, he has given over $45 billion away to his sons and the Bill Gates Foundation, which I'm kinda like, does that count? Maybe. But Bill Gates and Buffett launched the Giving Pledge, asking billionaires to commit to donating at least half of their wealth to charitable causes. So if he does have a hand in the world, I hope this isn't lies. Probably is. But you know, good guy Buffett. Good guy Buffett. Number six, the Albrecht family. Historically secretive, the Albrecht family is known for their ownership of Aldi and Trader Joe's. As for their personal lives today, there isn't a lot known, though their humble beginnings are quite touching in a way. After World War II, Theo and Carl Albrecht found their mother's old corner store still standing in Germany. So they not only brought it back to life, they gave it an entirely new one. They transformed it into the massive Aldi international grocery chain, earning a net worth of over 53.5 billion. In 2013, Aldi made over 13 billion in the US alone. In 1979, the family trust purchased Trader Joe's, which added immensely to their capital. After all, who else can eat their weight in organic almond butter? <laughs> 
Though a fair amount is known about their business life, the Albrechts keep their family life hidden away. They don't speak to the press or attend store openings. They almost sound like the Willy Wonka of grocery store chains. They don't own any vacation homes, private jets, yachts, and only keep a couple thousand euros in their bank account. So what are they doing with the rest of their money? We don't know. They elect to live secluded either to hide themselves or to hide something darker. Or it could just be that they just don't want to deal with the paparazzi. I wouldn't want to eat there personally. Number five, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Okay, technically not a family. I get it. But they might as well be their bros. Because why? Google. I debated just saying that one word and just leaving it there because, well, Google. You know? Don't know who they are? Google it. Who doesn't use Google at least a dozen times a day? I literally couldn't do this job without Google. So no, they aren't old money, they're not a family, but they have families. But they were two guys who started a legacy that changed the world forever. Page valued at 91.5 billion and Bryn valued at 89.5 billion started Google in 1998 and have since kept a pretty low profile. The two met at Stanford University while studying for their PhDs in computer science. They wanted to find a way to organize the world's information and make it universal universally accessible, and that they did, but maybe too well. Google was recently under fire in Australia as criticisms called out Google for playing a role in weakening the media. As someone who uses this stuff every day to do this stuff, I gotta say, they are kind of right. More often than not, the fastest, not the truest information is available first and foremost. I mean, consider how many videos we pump out a day. It's crazy. But if you do want to know more about how these two have a hand in the world, well, I don't know. Google it. Number four, number four, the Koch family. A couple of you commented as to why the Koch family wasn't on here. Well, that's because I was saving them for part two. Maybe. Fred C. Koch started America's largest private company when he co-founded the Wood River Oil and Refining Company in 1940, which would later become Koch Industries. Then it was just a bunch of nepotism after that, though there was a power struggle between the brothers Frederick and Bill. Their stakes were bought for over $800 million in 1983. Fred Koch's son, Charles, still remains the head of the industries today. There is, of course, controversy over how the business began, specifically to do with the Soviet and German powers at the time. That's right. The Koch family business is entrenched in what was the Third Reich. They built a refinery to fuel German warplanes during World War II. Even worse, Charles Koch, Fred's son, financed publications of Holocaust denial literature during the 1960s and 80s. I wonder why he would want to do that. Fred Koch also did dealings with Stalin, although after his experience with that guy, he was totally anti-communist. Makes sense. It seems the coaches began with a mind for business over humanity. The question is, with that much accumulated wealth today, are they still willing to deal with anyone no matter the cost of human life? Or do they just wanna make a buck? I don't know. Number three, Bill Gates. Good guy, Bill Gates. The man teens refer to when they are trying to convince their parents is a good idea to drop out of college or high school. Gates was actually an excellent student. He worked hard, uh, exceeded in every subject, but when he got to Harvard, the only reason he dropped out was because he could pursue a business with his partner, Paul Allen, to build Microsoft. Yeah, that's right. The Microsoft. His venture worked out and between 1995-2008, Bill was the richest man in the world. Unlike some other suspicious members on this list, Gates may actually be ruling the world with some kind of kindness behind him. He stepped down as chairman of Microsoft in 2014 to work on more charitable efforts through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and as I mentioned before, the thing with Warren Buffett. Yeah, if he does rule the world, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not cool about it, but I, I, I'm optimistic. Number two, Elon Musk. Okay, of course Elon Musk is gonna be on this list, especially since you know he's a dad now, so technically that's a family. And he's also got like six kids from another marriage, a whole bunch of stuff. So hes he, it's a family now, it's a family. While Musk himself is one of the wealthiest people in the world, I think he's the second on the Forbes list, his family didn't start that way. In fact, his mother at one point had to work five jobs just to support him. Even though Mae Musk is now known as the oldest woman to star in the Cover Up Girl campaign, she was actually struggling for a long time. When Elon was just 10, he taught himself how to code, and from there grew into the founder of Zip2, PayPal, SpaceX, and is now the CEO of Tesla today. Since March 2020, his fortune jumped by 514%. I wish my bank account would jump that high. Oh my god, do you know how much that is? That's $126.4 billion. Ah. When humanity begins to live in space, you can almost guarantee that Elon Musk is going to have some part 
of his name on that ship. His company SpaceX has already made massive steps towards space travel including his BFR translation Big Falcon Rocket. It is supposed to be a 31 engine rocket capable of carrying 100 people to space. A part of his goal to get humanity out to Mars. Not only is he absolutely loaded, but Musk's legacy may very well have a hand in the survival of the human race beyond the planet Earth. So, never mind ruling the world, this man could rule the stars. Coming in at number one, Jeffrey Bezos. Jeffrey Bezos. Jeffrey Bezos. The Bezos family is easily becoming, if it hasn't already, a new legacy. With Jeffrey Bezos at the helm. Though he was married prior to 2019, even his ex wife, Mackenzie Scott, has a net worth of over $57 billion from her stakes in the Amazon company which I think is just like 4%. Bezos has 16% stake in his entire company and he's the richest man in the world. That just goes to show how crazy successful Amazon is. Bezos founded the e-commerce giant Amazon in 1994, which started out as an online bookstore. Now it is the go-to place to get that thing you're not sure you need, but buy anyways at 3 a.m. so you can have it the next day. Yeah. It boomed throughout the pandemic, growing by 38% in revenues in 2020 because everyone was stuck at home. Where were they gonna do their shopping or get their Christmas presents? The company earned 386 billion in revenues that year. Though he did say he would give 100 billion to Feed America, the Amazon company came under scrutiny during the pandemic for its poor treatment of their warehouse workers. On top of being a master of e-commerce, Bezos now owns the Washington Post and Blue Origin, an aerospace company developing commercial use rockets, so kind of like Musk. As we know from the previous video, you control a part of the media, you control a part of the world. So honestly, considering how popular Amazon is, he's got us hook, line, and sinker. Mm -hmm.